everyone, and welcome to Heartbeat Alaska Native News and Native Information. We here at Heartbeat Alaska love to travel across the north, and today we travel off the beaten path. We travel to an island hundreds of miles off the shore, to the Pribilof Islands, as a matter of fact, to the beautiful island of St. George, and visit the beautiful people who live there. I'll be back with St. George right after this. There's no other place like it on Earth. Right. There's just no other place like it on Earth. There's, just, there's no economy here. Well, the government just didn't tell us anything. I think they, they should have given us a little bit of a warning. But... Hi, my name is Stefan Lustenkoff. I'm from St. George Island. And you're watching Heartbeat Alaska, and we'll be right back. Heartbeat Alaska is brought to you in part by Coastal Villages Region Fund. Thank you, CVRF, for your support of Heartbeat Alaska. And by the Nature Conservancy of Alaska, working with Alaska's rural communities to conserve and protect our natural heritage. Hi, I'm Mark from Scan Home, and we are proud to sponsor Heartbeat Alaska. Scan Home, serving all of Alaska's home and office furnishing needs. Thank you, Scan Home, for making Heartbeat Alaska possible. Heartbeat Alaska is brought to you in part by Brown's Electric Lighting Gallery. Thank you, Brown's Electric, for your generous support of Heartbeat Alaska. We've been covering businesses, families, and individuals since before Alaska was a state. And we'll keep doing it until the glaciers melt on Mount McKinley. Primera Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alaska. We're here. We're with you. There are two villages in the Pribilofs. St. Paul, the larger, has around 500 people. Today we visit the other village, St. George, with around 150 people. St. George is also home to millions of birds and thousands of seals. As a matter of fact, in the summertime, that population swells to around 3,000 fur seals to every person who lives there. It's a beautiful, unique place. Join me now as we travel to St. George. Hundreds of miles from the nearest land, Pribilof found his pot of gold. But in order to cash in, the Russians needed laborers and lots of them. They found their laborers on the Aleutian Islands. The Russian treatment of the Aleuts blurred the line between slavery and serfdom. In any case, Aleuts were taken from their homes to the uninhabited Pribilof Islands. Less than a hundred years later, 
the Russian government found itself mired in debt. U.S. investors saw they could make a fortune if they could only get their hands on the fur seal trade on these little islands. These investors just happened to meet with William Seward, the U.S. Secretary of State. In 1867, Seward convinced the U.S. Congress to buy Alaska for $7.2 million. For the Aleuts on the islands, the change meant little more than another new language and set of regulations to live by. Over the next hundred years, the treatment of the Aleuts and the seals they harvested slowly improved. Today, the old sealing plant sits empty, staring out at the relentless sea. Young seals play in the dock where boatloads of furs used to be shipped out. All that is left are ghosts and memories. I started working the sealing when I was sealing plant down there when I was uh, 17 years old. Andronik Kashiverov remembers the hard work. Uh, when we did the first seal harvest here, I worked as a, a pot cutter on the hauling grounds out there. Then there I moved down to the processing plant down there where I did from uh, taking all the skins back from the from the sealing plant all the way from the killing fields all the way back down to the uh, processing plant where we process them down there and. Uh, Ship and made it, did them out to the shipping down there. Along with the hard work, though, came the security of knowing where your next paycheck would come from. That is, until that day when it all ended. Well, the government just didn't tell us anything. I think they, they should have given us a little bit of a warning, but I don't think we got that or just like uh, overnight. In 1973, the U.S. government abruptly shut down the first seal harvest on the St. George Island. After generations of government parenting, the descendants of those original slaves were set adrift to find their own way. I think uh, the government in the early years were trying to move us all off the island here. They had, uh, they were, every time a family left here, they would tear down the house there. But uh, all of a sudden that stopped because a lot of people refused to move from here. The empty lots where houses used to be can still be seen. Things began to go in a different direction when the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act set up native corporations across the state. When the land claims came in effect, came here and it started on the, you know, through the state that uh, I think that helped us a lot so we couldn't move after that. I think that's, you know, that's one of the big reasons that really helped there. I'm sure glad that came around. Otherwise, I think we'd probably been a ghost town or something like that, you know. The federal government quickly began to see they were obligated to do something for the islanders. Well, the government gave us $10 million to start up a different economy. The government also gave the islanders many of the buildings on the island, buildings that had been decaying for decades. It took a lot of money to fix the infrastructure, to bring it up to uh, code and everything else like that. So $10 million didn't go a long ways, and so we went back to Congress and got more money for that to uh, do more infrastructure and stuff out there. Then we started on the fisheries, started building the harbors. Andronic is vice president of operations for St. George Tanak Corporation. Tanak, a native corporation formed under the Alaska Native Land Claims Settlement Act of 1971 continues to do great things for the island by securing government contracts for restoration and construction projects they provide jobs for islanders but as Andronic is keenly aware there are only so many projects on the island the government can't supply the island's payroll forever we have, the guys would have to leave the island or if they can make it possible take their family out them but it's going to have to it'll come to that sooner or later if there's nothing else in the island and, and all. It might get a little bit more quieter in here. But the truth of the matter is... 
Well, it's just, there's no economy here, I mean, other than uh, halibut fishery and uh, a little bit of tourism. Max Malabonski is 22 years old. Even though he grew up here, he only lives on St. George in the summertime. The hunting right now is kind of slim. Around here, you have a lot of people moving off island and stuff, and coming back to fish, you know, during the summers, and moving back out and going to school or doing whatever. Max you know. wants to return to St. George after school, but realizes that he'll probably have to stay off island in order to make a living. A lot of the high school kids nowadays, after they graduate, they move off island because there's nothing here for them. It's sad to say. Peter Lekinoff is trying to make a living working on his brother Dennis's halibut boat. Well, we set gear last night and uh, about seven o'clock, I to pick up, took off the harbor about eight o'clock last night. Today, Dennis and his crew are long lining for halibut. Though they can make decent money on a good day, the fishing economy here has ridden up and down in waves, taking the islanders with it. The fresh Alaskan crab we might see on a menu usually comes from the Bering Sea. And that fresh Alaskan crab funds city governments on the Pribilof. But after a few boom years of big harvest and big money, the crab stocks crashed and haven't recovered. So the boys are here looking for halibut. Basically go out there, drop your line overnight, pick it up the next day. Whatever halibut you catch, you gut. It's sold to the puffin seafoods here, and they're delivered to China to St. Paul. So the guys get their checks about a week later for what they catch. Past couple years, you know, it's hard to start catching fish around here. There has been finger pointing about why fish stocks are declining around the Pribilofs. No one can say for sure what's happening, but Peter is concerned about the future. The, I don't know about the restrictions, but we, during the spring, we watched uh, these 300-foot draggers coming through here, and then a one after another, just practically side by side. By draggers, Peter is referring to big trawling ships that drag huge nets. The nets are sometimes dragged or raked right across the bottom. Peter agrees with many experts who say raking may damage certain habitats. And we don't know, you know, if they're mid-trawling or bottom-trawling. Not knowing is a large part of the issue. The declines could be caused by anything from climate change to habitat change to overfishing. But whatever the cause, the problem hits home. I've got two daughters and a son, you know, you got to... Start thinking about them. There is a no trawl zone around the Pribilof Islands. The idea is to protect local fisheries for islanders. Anthony Merculia is a fisherman. I think the boundaries of the um, <coughs> of the area that encompasses uh, the Pribilof Islands needs to be extended southward. I think uh, the lines are drawn to accommodate m more. More, I mean, be more accommodating to the trawlers than, than to us. The North Pacific Fishery Management Council regulates fishing here. But as an island of only 160 people, the voices of the big fishing corporations easily drown them out. You know, we, we've been going to the meetings, we've been going to North Pacific Management Council and bringing our grievances and everything else like that, but sometimes I think we just go there for nothing. I don't think we get anything done out there, but. You know, it's all political, I guess. <laughs> Whatever the reason for the declining fish stocks in the Bering Sea, it's affecting more than just the people on the island. And I've noticed that now the fur seals, the females, have to go further and further out to get what they need to eat. And by the time they get back here, well, their pups are gone. They're dead. One of the big fears in the Pribilofs is that fur seals now listed as depleted, may become endangered. If that happens, all fishing may be shut down. The decline of St. George's wildlife could have profound effects on the island's other hope for an economy, tourism. 
There is no question there's plenty of wildlife for folks to say hello to. It's an incredible place. There, there are species that exist here in incredible numbers that um, don't exist in these numbers anywhere else in the world. Uh, for example, northern fur seals, 80% of the world's population, um, come here each summer to breed. Red-legged kittiwake. It's one of the only places you'll find them is in the Bering, Bering Sea, and the best place to see them is in the Pribilof Islands. There's no other place like it on Earth. Right. There's just no other place like it on Earth. There's no place that people can go and see some of these birds in the numbers and the abundance that we've just seen today. Debbie Harrison and Olga Romanenko are hiking to St. George's famous high bluffs. The bluffs tower a thousand feet above the sea and have some of the greatest concentrations of seabirds in the world. There's clearly a tremendous opportunity. More and more people are getting into, uh, are attracted to ecotourism experiences. Uh, we're seeing rapid increases in uh, numbers of people who recognize themselves as birders and I think that the communities of St. Paul and St. George will need to make a decision as to how and how much they want to promote ecotourism in this area without losing those tremendous characteristics that make it so unique. But even with a beautifully restored hotel and new runway, St. George can still be almost as hard to find as it was back in 1786. When the fog rolls in and the planes can't find the runway, they don't land. This makes travel expensive and hard to schedule. When you talk about a working group, I see the working group here. When Heartbeat Alaska returns, we'll learn how some ideas to help the Pribilof Islands came from the islands on the opposite end of the country. Hi, I'm Max Molovansky. I'm from St. George, and I watch Heartbeat Alaska. Jeannie Green Productions, Alaska's premier commercial, documentary, and event production team. Whenever and wherever you need video production, our experienced, dedicated professionals give your project the extra edge you're looking for. Alaska Native owned and operated. Genie Green Productions, your complete video production service. Hi, I'm Lisa Zam with Alaska Family Hospice, your home in the city. We would like to invite you to stay with Alaska Family, located right next to the Alaska Native Medical Center. We will have a new addition for our special prenatal guest, a beautiful prenatal home. Call to make your reservations. This fall and winter, every guest is entered in a very special drawing every week for gift certificates and in December, a grand drawing. So the next time you're coming to Anchorage, stay with Alaska Family, your home in the city. After uh, using drugs so long, I lost interest in everything else besides that. When I OD'd, I, you know, I stopped breathing, my heart stopped, I flatlined for three minutes. I thought I was able to handle it, but I guess I wasn't. I think it was a miracle that I'm alive today. Well, I didn't really try to kill myself, but I tried to get high, and I ended up killing myself in a way. The problems with the economy on St. George are very real. The very existence of the village could depend on decisions made by the islanders in the near future. This spring, St. George had some visitors from a long way away. We've got some great people here. Uh, when you talk about a, a working group, I see the working group here. I talk to some of the fishermen. Some of the deals we've made in other parts of the world and country are already happening here. I see the people at the table. You talk about Tony Irochi is a commercial fisherman in the Florida Keys. He's visiting the island with a group from the Nature Conservancy of Alaska and the World Wildlife Fund. Tony worked to set up marine protected areas in the waters around the Florida Keys. The group held a town meeting to help show how conservation and fishing can go hand in hand. 
it, it seems like a paradox. You close an area to fishing, how is that possibly going to benefit fishermen? But actually, it's, it's really simple, and it's been shown in more than 100 studies worldwide that if you close an area to destructive fishing practices, the fish that live in that area are able to survive longer, grow much bigger, and most importantly, they reproduce much more successfully. So you've set aside a, a fairly small area usually, but the, the resident population in that, that reserve area is able to help replenish the surrounding fishing grounds. I like what they're thinking, because for me, and not only for me, but for these younger ones, that's, what, that's, that's how it's going to benefit them. I mean, before it's too late, something has to be done now. One of the other things that could shore up St. George's economy is reopening the fish processing plant on the island. Yummy. With the processor, the fish would be worth more when they left the island, so the islanders could keep more of the profit. But I think some of the people, some of the companies that are kind of worried about putting anything here on the island is uh, if the fish is there, the fish is there and the market is there, I think it's, it's, you, know, you could put a processing plant here, but if there's nothing really out in the ocean to process, you know, why should you put it here? And that's coming from them directly. If the people of St. George agree to set aside certain parts of this vast ocean so fish can have a safe place to breed and grow, there will be even more work ahead. The islanders and outside commercial fishing interests will need to come together to find a shared vision and take a common plan to the North Pacific Fisheries Council. But there is hope in the foggy air of this island. There is hope that through hard work and by taking risks, the people of St. George will not have to leave this place they love. Georgie Kashaverov explains. Working with all entities and trying to come up with a um, economic development plan to see what we can do for this community. Um, Whoever said that uh, a bad day is a fishing is better than a good day at work, yeah. that's true. Yeah. So we're just a beautiful small community and everybody's close with each other and we'd like to see change and um, growth in our community. And, and hopefully we can get our economic state up there. We're working on that. Hopefully we get something going with all the entities on the island working together on that. An ancient Aleut hunter found these islands after many days at sea in his Ica or kayak. After he returned home, the legend of the first seal islands he called Amik was passed down for generations. It was only by the greed of outsiders that the Aleuts came to live on this sleeping volcano. The people here today represent the seventh generation of islanders, descended from the Aleuts the Russians forced to come here. Their names are constant reminders of the past. Lestinkov, Lekhanov, Malavansky, Kashavera. Their history is all around them. But these are no longer displaced people. They are home. You said you would play basketball with her. She said she'll never speak to you again. <laughs> Parents that are involved with their kids are more likely to help keep their kids away from drugs. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing but that. <laughs> Each week, 
Heartbeat Alaska brings you great stories from all over the state. And we couldn't do it without the generous support of Frontier Flying Service. Frontier gets our camera crews where they need to go. So whenever you see a Frontier plane, give them a wave. Say hi from Nutsack. You might just be on Heartbeat Alaska. Frontier Flying Service, covering Alaska for over 50 years. Since our visit to St. George, representatives from commercial fishing interests from the islands itself and from Nature Conservancy have held meetings. They're working together and coming together to find ways to protect the unique way of life in the Pribilof Islands. Thank you so much, Nature Conservancy and St. George Tanat Corporation for making this story possible. And thank you for joining us. Join us again next week, won't you, for more Heartbeat Alaska. I'm Jeannie Green. Have wonderful holidays. I'll be back next week. And right now, the males are coming in to set up their territories. They're harem breeders. So like the what they call the beach masters, the big guys will get the best spots close down to the water and they'll have harems of you know up to 60 females Woo, and then as you oh, I don't know they're uh, they fight pretty hard for their territory um, it's pretty this time of year it can be pretty messy apparently um, yeah just sort of you know by by midsummer they're um, uh, they've mellowed out some they kind of have learned where everybody's territory is so they're not they're, there's a lot of display but not that much actual fighting but they hang out, the males will hang out all summer long here and lose something like 40 or 50 percent of their body weight. Oh. Purchase a copy of this program, ask for Heartbeat Alaska, heartbeat number 1122, that's heartbeat number 1122, and send your check or money order to Jeannie Green Productions, 6216 Old Seward Highway, Anchorage, Alaska, 99518, or give us a call, 907-563-7440.